what does our foundation look like? It's not making excuses because it's not too late to secure that thing up, to shore up that foundation, to put some piers underneath the house of your faith.
The wise man built his house upon the rock. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> this is a familiar parable. We've heard this a lot about the building a house on rock, building a house on sand. I remember like a kid song about it when I was little in Sunday school. And it was like, it's weird to see kids like kind of all joyful about the house getting washed away and the rains come up in the muds and it went flat and they're all like laughing. Like, it's like, it's just pretty tragic. <laughs> but the song sticks with you and you remember the story because of it. But sometimes something gets so familiar, this little story about foundations, that you kind of miss the main point of what's going on. So I'm going to ask you a little bit of audience participation. Just throw something at me. What does it mean to have a house built on the rock? What does that what does it mean? Just throw something at me. Solid. 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 What does it mean like in a biblical sense to have a foundation built on the rock? Built on God. Built on God. Yeah. Sturdy. Something sturdy. Yeah. Okay, this is great. The kid's song ends with these lines, build your house on the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come down. The blessings go down and the prayers go up. The blessings go down and the prayers right? It sounds great. So build your life on the Lord. Awesome teaching, right? Really good teaching. But Jesus isn't really cryptic with what building your house on the rock is. He spells it right out. Because we can really hyper-spiritualize it and go, it must mean something about the teachings of Jesus and leaning on God as the rock. It's all good and all true. But let's just cut to the chase and look at Matthew 7. What does he say building on the rock is? Verse 24 of Matthew 7 says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So... This story comes right at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He does this like awesome sermon, the best sermon arguably ever, ever spoken. And it's chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. He's got crowds following him. He goes up this mountain. <clears throat> There's people that he's just healed, people's lives that he's touched and changed. He's got disciples that are just now following him. And since he opens his mouth, he began to teach them. And Jesus gives this master class on Christian life. Pitfalls to watch out for, good solid teaching, things that you can just build your life on. How we interact with others. And then he ends this whole long, I encourage you to read this. I always say that every time, I encourage you to read this. This is an awesome sermon. Like, if it's written in red, you know it's the words of Jesus. This is just something to pour over because it's encouragement, it's convicting, it makes you check yourself and go, what am, how am I living? How am I treating others? Read the Sermon on the Mount. But one of the main issues that comes up, and if you've been in Bible study, we've talked about this, and you're, you're tired of me saying it, but one thing that just bugs Jesus, I think I would say it's probably the thing that bugs him the most, hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And it seems like a lot of sin fits under that same umbrella. That's a weird word. We maybe have a vision of what, hip what a hypocrite is or what hypocrisy means. Maybe it's saying one thing and doing something else. Or may it, maybe it's saying one thing and not doing anything. But the root of this word means to pass judgment on. Hypocrite. And here in this text here in Matthew, it means to be a pretender. To be an actor. An actor. That's what a hypocrite is. I think back, and this is something I don't think Jen probably even knows about me, so this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was a skateboarder. Yeah, hard to believe. Yeah, wow, I can believe it. It was a phase. My brother was older than me. He liked to skateboard. I kind of copycat him. But in skateboarding world, there's people that really know how to like shred and thrash, and they can do skills. You see them. They got a cast on where they broke their wrist, and they're tough people. And then there's the people that just want to look 
like a, they want the stickers to put on their skateboard, or they want to wear their clothes and the vans, and they want to look the part. And if you're a real skater, that's called a poser. A poser. <laughs> oh, nothing cuts more than being called a poser. Uh, <laughs> I had to look up if it was a swear word before I brought it up. It was easy to say it like it was nothing. But I'm like, I say that in church. I gotta make sure. <laughs> An actor, a pretender, <laughs> trying to be something you're not. So, hypocrisy, the heart of a lot of sin, pretending to be an actor, one thing on Sunday when we come in here, and maybe something different when we go out Monday through Saturday. Mm -hmm. Projecting something we're not. Social media, that kind of stuff's full of this, just this beautiful life that maybe isn't as beautiful as it appears. Are you guys familiar with method acting? Mm -hmm. These people go deep into roles and they like gain 30 pounds for a part or lose 40 pounds for a role. They take it real seriously. They maybe they only want people around them to call them by the name of this person they're acting. Um, I, I think about uh, um, Jamie Foxx when he did Ray Charles. Like he took it so seriously, I was reading that he literally had his eyelids glued shut for 14 hours at a time just to be in that role and take it seriously. Mm -hmm. He said he had anxiety and panic attacks just from literally having his eyelids glued shut. But I think about like a cowboy. You know, you maybe learn to ride horses and you go spend a couple months on a ranch and you just soak up the, call me Earl, don't call me Nate. That's <laughs> who I am right now. And I'm like strutting around the house, you know. That's method acting, pretending to be somebody. And then the lights and the camera go off it's just Nate, right? Mm -hmm. Just chaps and spurs and, and a cowboy hat. I can look the part. I can convince the viewers, right? I can win an Oscar. Mm -hmm. I can deliver the lines on time and then feel the part. But in reality, I can't run a ranch. I can't drive horses. I'm just pretending. Mm -hmm. So what does any of that have to do with building your house on a rock? When I read this passage, I have like 50 questions. Partly because I'm a weirdo, and I just ask questions about everything. But when I read this, I go, you know, what does it mean to build a house on the rock? This is just a few verses. What's it mean to build a house on the sand? What's it mean to build a house at all? What, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. What does it mean when the floods come? And then we see all this points in a lot of ways to hypocrisy. Not being an actor that says the lines with perfect timing, sounding convincing, but following through. It's the heart of Jesus' story here. So beyond just taking this idea of a foundation that's built on Jesus and, and making it really hyper-spiritual, which is fine, we're going to look at exactly what Jesus says. We don't have to guess. Verse 24, he says, everyone then, this unlocks everything. And not that it's that hard to see, but sometimes you just miss it. It's in plain sight. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built a house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words in verse 26 and does not do them, will be like a foolish man. That's the contrast. And this whole passage is set up with all these contrasts, wise and foolish, sand and stone. But, he says, those who don't do, don't do what? These words of mine. And then you, my next question is, well, what are these words of mine? It's a little vague. Is it just Jesus' good teaching, like, is he just another good prophet, like Terry said? Or is it more than that? And this is where we expand out beyond just this little parable illustration about houses and foundations. And look that it's within the whole Sermon on the Mount. It's within the whole Bible. There's a lot to it. A lot in the red letters. He talks about, just in this message, about not abolishing the law and fulfilling the law. The importance of prayer, giving to the poor, fasting, Ask, seek, knock. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, do not judge. He says, the golden rule, which actually is in your Bible, do unto others. All kinds of teaching we can apply to our lives. That's these words of mine. If you don't do these words of mine, so it doesn't help to just look at the foundations. we got to zoom out a little bit and look at what else he's been preaching about. Mm -hmm. And then apply it to our lives. So, in that same context of building a house, it's talking about bearing fruit. Do you bear fruit or don't you bear fruit? 
And then, not that that's inconsequential, those are what gets you into heaven. You enter the kingdom of heaven because you bear fruit, because you do what you say you do, because you live out what you say you believe. My next question I ask, what does it mean to be wise? What's it take to be like the wise man? We're blessed to have Pastor Terry and Minister Penny as well, because we get solid teaching here. There's no way around it. You can't come in here and, and you go to a lot of churches, you may never see a Bible, you may never hear the word Jesus. You may hear great, encouraging, motivational speeches that make you want to take on the world, but you may not hear the Bible. And here you're going to come in here, and I'm blessed to sit under teaching like that. But we're going to hear, amen? amen? You're going to hear the word. You're going to hear the truth shared. We're blessed by that. We hear Jesus' teaching. We hear these words of mine. When Jesus says these words of mine. We're hearing it every Sunday. We hear the teaching. And not just here, if we're really making ourselves available. We're hearing on the radio, on podcasts, and a million books that sit on our shelves that are dusty. You know, We have no excuse because the words of mine, Jesus' teaching, are right around us everywhere. We have no excuse. But how are we living? Are we judging others with a higher standard than we do ourselves? Are we treating others the same way we want to be treated, not just some golden rule that's like a real thing in your Bible? Do we have uncontrolled anger, uncontrolled lust? Are we giving to the poor? Are we fasting, praying? Are we worrying all the time? It says, don't worry. Are we trusting that God knows what we need? And then let me just land on this one. Is God's kingdom really what we are seeking first. Being wise means we hear these teachings, what our Bible says, what Pastor Terry and Minister Penny remind us of, and then we base all of our actions on those words of mine. It's not that you quote the right verse, you impress the people around you, but that we, our lives reflect <coughs> the wisdom of that teaching. You don't look wise until you live out what you're professing to be true, right? So that's wisdom. What's foolishness? What's it mean to be like the foolish man? I've mentioned this also, I think, in Bible study before about just the seriousness of the word fool. And I know Jen, that's a word like a, that's a real sort of word to her. You don't call people fool. It's not something you just throw around loosely. And she didn't just get that out of a hat. Where does that idea come from? The Bible, right? Yeah. Not just the Bible. It's not some obscure passage in Habakkuk in your Old Testament. It's in this same sermon. What does Jesus say about foolishness? In Matthew 5, he says, But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. This is where he's saying, you look at your Old Testament, you look back at your Ten Commandments, it says don't murder. He's saying it's next level. Getting angry is... It's as bad as murder. It has the same consequences, if not more than murder. So let me continue. I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So we take that verse and you go, okay, we shouldn't call people fools. And there's reasons behind that, because you're questioning someone's humanity. You're questioning who they are at their heart. When you call someone a fool, you're questioning their judgment. So fool isn't just something we loosely throw around. So when Jesus says something's foolish, your antenna better come up and go, okay, this is serious. This has consequences. He's talking about acting after you hear his teaching. Building your house on sand, which he spells out very clearly, is hearing my words and not acting on them is foolish. It has the same consequences. A fool is someone who knows what to do and either does something totally different or does nothing at all. That's what a fool does. Because there's people, there's people that are helpless and we make dumb decisions. I don't want to be called a fool. I make dumb decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reese says, amen. <laughs> but it's knowing better and pushing on through despite what you know and still doing stupid things despite how bad the consequences are. 
That's what foolishness is. Wow. One thing that stands out in this passage to me is that the same elements happen to the guy that builds his house on the rock and happens to the guy that builds his house in the sand. The same exact situation and circumstances happen to him. Let's see what it says in 24. It says, the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew. 27, exact same thing. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew. So it's not a matter of if the rains fall, floods come, wind blows. It's when, right? It's not if, it's when. And that seems disheartening. What I love this Christian life is supposed to be a walk in the park. You know, I've got to do this. But he's just spelling it out for us. I think back on... Um, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Sounds great. He's beside the still waters, he restores my soul, he guides my paths in righteousness. That's awesome. The next verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What about the paths of righteousness? Sometimes those paths of righteousness lead through the valley of the shadow. But what's the hump, the hope, the comfort that we have coming out of that? I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And it goes on and on about how you're part of God's household. That's an awesome song. I love it. But it reminds me that you're going to face adversities. The path of righteousness sometimes leads through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes you're going to face winds and and storms. But what does it really look like? That's like a thing we can all go, oh, I get it, storms of life. But when you really zoom in on what storms in life are, it's uncomfortable because it means sickness and hurt and financial stress. It means people dying. It means having more month than you do money at the end of it all. It means your car breaks down and the people that could help you are out of town. Rain falls, it drips through your roof and ruins things. And the rivers from that flood rise up and there's anxiety. You feel tightness in your chest because you're stressed out because life gets hard. And the winds pound against the walls of your house. Life is tough, right? Mm -hmm. In this world, you will have trouble. Mm -hmm. Same thing, you turn the corner on that. We can trust in the Lord. We know that He's got it. Jen laughs at me because in the middle of COVID, when everybody was like doing home renovations, like everybody started restoring stuff, tearing stuff. You're just trapped in your house, so I'm sick of looking at this old paint. I'm going to paint it. Yeah. Well, we were guilty as charged. So we started doing some stuff, and like we decided to redo a bunch of stuff on the porch. I put some new porch columns on. I put a new door in. And we got modern technology. There's no reason to not know what the weather's going to be. And I like the weather following it, so I knew the weather was coming. But I'm going to get this door put in there. And I, I get the door put in. I'm proud. Well, we got to paint the door. I painted the door. Even black clouds are coming in. Like It kind of needs a second coat. So I'm like, wind's coming. You can see it. I'm getting that last coat on there. And Jen's going to be like, you're crazy. And then, bam! I'm on the porch, and there's a tree that is as close as that camera is to me. Three trees in a little island fall on my neighbor's house. I'm like, I'm not kidding. I'm as close here as there are to these trees. A derecho. That's what they call it. I've never even heard of that before. Straight line winds. Yeah. Bam. The it's storm. paint dropping everywhere. It's <laughs> running because it's raining. So <laughs> finish that thought. <laughs> well... Sometimes you gotta get the job. <laughs> hey, this isn't a press conference. <laughs> no, so my point is. Thanks, Jim. What do we have that takes care of that? Insurance, right? And I don't know if you knew this or not, but when your trees fall on someone else's house, who takes care of that? The other person. What? Yeah, my three trees fell on my neighbor's house. I call my insurance, or like, no, that's going to be his insurance. I was sick to my stomach. Like, I felt like I pushed those trees over on his house personally. But 
So what does insurance do? There's this, this this saying in the insurance industry: they make you whole. They make you whole. That means they get you back to where you were. When something gets damaged, they, they fix it and make it whole. And I think, I say all this to say, Jesus makes us whole. He makes us whole. He doesn't want to see calamity fall on us when we're tested and trials of life come on us. He doesn't want to see us destroyed. He makes us whole. In life, are we going to have storms? Are we going to have shingles blow off the roof of our house, our spiritual house? Yes, you are going to be challenged and tried and tested. You're going to have some siding that falls off and some branches and some chainsaw work to do and some phone calls to make. But Jesus will make you whole. Amen. Way better than Jake from State Farm <laughs> or anybody else. Jesus will make you whole. So what does it take to really be standing after those storms come? Because that's what we're talking about. The difference between hearing the teaching and acting on the teaching. In the Christian life, we're going to have the storms come. It's unavoidable. But what separates fools from Christ followers is how we navigate through those storms. When we live by Jesus' words and we practice what we preach, we avoid that destruction. And the big difference, the house built on the sand, that's what you thought you knew because it was a theory. It was a great idea. It was a good teaching. Because we can agree the Bible's full of good teaching. But this isn't about what you think you know. It's about what you know you know because you put it into practice. Not just in emergency situations, pull the ripcord. Because every day, part of your life is trusting in Jesus and putting into practice what you know. Falling versus not falling. Let's get to the serious part. What does it mean to fall? What does it mean to not fall? Again, I've got lots of questions. Let's go back a couple of verses. Jesus, he just warns about false prophets. He says, uh, they look like sheep, but they're really wolves. He's warning about in the same sermon. How can you tell if they're legit, if their teaching is sound? Because they bear good fruit, right? Bad trees don't bear good fruit. Good trees don't bear bad fruit. He says, you know, you're not going to get grapes from a thistle bush. And a thistle bush isn't going to grow grapes. Wow. But then he says this. If you're not bearing good free fruit, those trees get cut down and thrown in the fire. Now, there's nothing funny about that. No jokes to be made. Because we know what that means. That's harsh. What? Thrown in the fire for not bearing fruit? Well, look at this verse right here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, nothing funny here. No jokes to be made. This is like really serious. This speaks of God's judgment. But that doesn't seem fair. These people are seemingly doing things. They're casting out demons in their name. They're doing many works, I think. This is tough teaching. I don't get it. Well, look at this context again. Let's just zoom in on this verse. What do you notice about what's highlighted up here? A contrast again. The one who says, Lord, Lord, calling out Lord, Lord, like it's a title and not like actually your master of your life. The one who says, Lord, Lord, and the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. But what about all that stuff they did? Actors, posers, doing this stuff, looking the part, wanting the attention. Look who we're healing. Look what we're doing. Draw the attention to me. In Jesus' name, we're healing people. Like, what? Lord, I have no idea. You are calling me Lord with your lips, and you don't mean it in your heart. I never knew you. Those who say, Lord, and those who do the will. But before we just go, oh, that's about false prophets. That's, how does that connect to me? I'm not a prophet, let alone a false prophet. Look at 24, says what we just read today. Everyone who hears these words of mine, and then verse 26 ends, it says again, everyone who hears these words of mine. That's us. If you've heard these words, if you've heard Pastor Terry or Minister Penny, or if you're sitting here today, you have heard Jesus' words. James 1 reminds us, 
but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. That imagery is so perfect. You look in a mirror and you like know there's some things you need to adjust. Oh, I missed a spot shading there, or my shirt needs tucked in, whatever. And then you walk away and don't change anything. That's what he's talking about. That's what happens when we come into church and we go, that's a oh, good point, good point. Yeah, me, me also, yeah. And then go, what's for lunch? Because that's what happens a lot of times. It's awesome. It feels great to be here. And you know what? I preach these things because... It's what the Lord is dealing with me about. For real. Yeah. These thoughts come into my head. It's the Lord. It'll be like a month or so in advance. Like, and I'm wrestling through something about... Because I know I'm, I'm beating the same drum about it. It's like every time I'm preaching, it's about hearing things and not actually doing them. It's because the Lord is haunting me about it. Do something today. Don't just know the teaching. Don't just share the teaching. Don't just pass on the good teaching. Live the life. So when I say that again, this is not just Nate up here dumping the pulpit. This is Nate speaking from a heart that is convicted about these same things. Mm. Don't look at the mirror. See some changes. See that your hair is messed up and you got broccoli stuck in your teeth and leave it there. Take it out. Fix it. I'm going to close with some of this here. When the gospel writer ends, the red letters stop. The Sermon of the Mount is over, concluded. And then Matthew seems to slip in these words that are kind of a throwaway, but they say so much. Verse 29 says, or 28, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So this is powerful. The crowds are astonished at his teaching. Sure, the subject matter is awesome. It's the most amazing teaching you could ever hear, just all compiled into this one sermon, all perfectly crafted and delivered. But more than the message is the messenger, the authority behind Jesus. Mm -hmm. What gives him that authority? They're amazed at his teaching because of the authority. The scribes and the leaders, it's, that's what it says, right? He was teaching them as one that authority, not as their scribes, another contrast. How do the scribes teach? Well, the scribes, they reference other scribes, right? What I'm saying today is great because scribe Bob, 100 years ago, said the same thing, and I'm just parroting back. So we know this teaching is based on, and I don't have to live this teaching. We just know it's good teaching. It's the right word. It's the word of God. It's the law. Because we can always have sacrifices and atone for our sins and like, keep on sinning. That's how the scribes operate. The scribes have excuses. The scribes can... Preach and not practice what they preach. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't just teach out of a rule book, okay? Jesus writes the rule book. He already wrote it, and then he writes his sermon, paraphrasing, crafting this beautiful rule book to follow. And then more than just saying the right things, what gives Jesus ultimate authority? That he lives it out. He's a model. The Bible says that Jesus is the model for humanity. He comes to earth as God, but he makes this example for us. If we're looking for, how do humans make it when the storms come through? You watch Jesus because Jesus had struggles. Man of sorrow is well acquainted with grief. And how did he handle it? He handled it with authority. So can we have the authority of God? No. But can we also model for people around us, for the lives around us, what it looks like to know good teaching and to live out good teaching. The kingdom of God, as he says in this sermon, needs to be our first priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, built on a foundation of truth and what James calls being a doer who acts, not an actor who pretends not a Hollywood actor who's a cowboy, a real cowboy. Not a green screen and a bunch of computer, 
That's not how our faith is. It's fooling people, concealing, wearing the costume, convincing people, actually being the part. And get this, too. I think in the Christian world, we say, do you know God? Do you know the Lord? That's like this like, evangelistic thing we would say. Well, what does this ask us? Does the Lord know you? When Jesus says, I never knew you, that's what we say, right? Like, Do you know the Lord? Does the Lord know you? Mm -hmm. <sighs> when the storm comes, when the storm comes, you get soaked by the rain and the water's rising and the winds are slamming against your house, against your faith, against what you know to be true, will there be a total collapse, a great fall? Because those winds, that's the culture pushing in, it's testing your foundation. Is it going to stand? Is it going to fall? I'm going to leave us with this question. What does your foundation look like? This obviously is so much more about good house building. This isn't some lesson on like structural soundness of homes. Like, pick the perfect soil. Like, no. There's so much more than that. You see these commercials on TV for foundation restoration. You ever seen these? They're on during the news and all kinds of things. They claim it's something that's big around here specifically, but I think it's everywhere. There's cracks in your foundation. Do you have bowing walls and cracks in your foundation and bricks separating and you see like the hole, right? Mm -hmm. I did some work at my neighbor's house just a couple days ago. And the contractors point out how there's this like cracks above the door frame. That's like a telltale sign that your foundation's got problems, right? How do I know this? Because I've got cracks over my own door frame in my house. <laughs> and then he looks when the homeowner's gone, the contractor goes, he thinks it's because there's blasting going on. Like, kind of rolls his eyes, you know, because that's the way everybody says, too. Well, there's blasting, and it could be from blasting. But I'm telling you, it makes us think, what does our foundation look like? So I'm making excuses, because it's not too late to secure that thing up, to shore up that foundation, to put some piers underneath the house of your faith. Look in the spiritual crawl space. Look at the corners of your doorposts and around your windows. Is there cracks? Does the foundation have stair steps up of it? Because the shifting winds of the culture are going to challenge your beliefs. And are we going to live out what we know to be true? But there's good news. Storms blow shingles off your roof, and the siding gets torn off, and there's branches in the yard. But more than these companies you see on TV, in the foundation restoration world, God, too, he is a foundation restoration specialist. Amen. Amen? Amen. Man, we, we, we serve and believe in a God that wants you to be on a foundation of rock. He doesn't want to call anybody fools. He doesn't want to see anybody go to hell or suffer in fire or judgment. He wants you to lean into what you know to be true, to do and act. To hear these words of mine and act on them. Amen. 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 Let's sing a song. You guys want to sing a song? Amen. Let's sing a song. I'm with you. I want to hear that bass voice. <laughs> <laughs> this song will be familiar because we just sang it. On Christ the solid rock I stand on the ground. Sinking sand on the other sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock and stand on the other ground. Sinking sand on the other ground. Sinking sand in darkness. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. Every high and stormy gale, my anger holds with in the veil. Oh, when the song is rock, I stand on the ground with singing sand. On Christ the solid rock and stand on the ground is sinking sand. On the other ground is sinking sand. 
Lord, we lift you up. We praise you for this service, Lord. We praise you for your word, what it gives us, how it convicts us, how it cuts us and reminds us that we need to make course corrections, how we need to shore up our foundation, Lord. I just pray you would be with me, you'd be with everyone here, Lord, as we examine ourselves, as we think about how we can follow through how we can do more than just have the right ideas, but actually live them out in ways that inspire the world to want to follow us and want to serve you. Lord, we want you to say you know us. Not that we've tricked everyone around us into thinking that we know you and you know us, but that you know us, that we walk in relationship with you. Not that you're the best idea, but that you are our heavenly Father, that we are part of your family, Lord. We love you so much. Help us to build our foundation. Help us to shore up and strengthen our foundation. Lord, today, as we leave this place, be with everyone here, I pray, Lord. Encourage us, strengthen our hearts, embolden us to speak truth to those that are around us. Let us be a light. Let us be a city on a hill. Let us shine out to the people around us, Lord, that we're not actors. We're not putting the title Christian on our shirts and bumper stickers on our car and playing a part that we are really your children and we're thankful for that. Lord, we love you so much. I pray you be with all my brothers and sisters here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.